ask you. <laughs> sure. And it's when I pull up the website, there's this picture of you. Oh, boy. Did you have long hair? Oh, boy. Before, because I was looking at this photo, <laughs> and I've been meaning to ask you. So hold on. Here it is. That's so awesome. here's your, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. You can see my this little rat tail. tail hanging out. I was like, what is this thing <laughs> hanging off the side of your head? Go oh, there! Boom! Why don't you introduce yourself uh, to everyone? Yeah, I'm Brian Mineo. Yep. Uh, I am local now to San Diego. But I like to say I'm from Redondo Beach. Even though I'm not from Redondo Beach, I became a man in Redondo Beach. Yep. Like that was when I really became an adult um, because I'm from Texas. And not because I'm from Texas. Like that's, that's like a reason. Uh, but being <laughs> Having from... come to California to become a man? Well, I, I kind of like found myself here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think is, is what I'm trying to say. Texas is great. It was a great childhood, but it wasn't really ever me. And I think I was always sort of the outcast in a very controlled sense because I was looking for something different. Yeah. And that's all I had. That's all I knew was Texas. And I'm not super conservative in any ways. So coming to California, I found the ocean. I found myself. It was like a really transformational move. Nice. Yeah. So what brought you out here originally? Literally the ocean. So I started as, let me backtrack. So I swam my entire life up through like 18, up through high school. I was good. I wasn't great. I just love being in the water. Like I'm not a naturally super competitive person, except for board games. So in the water, I just love swimming, and I love the experience of like feeling the water and moving in all directions. So that kind of led into not being the best swimmer, but just being the guy that everyone liked on the team. And I was friends. I would support you. I would cheer you on. And thought nothing of this as far as a career goes. Moved to New York uh, after college, and at that point, I was starting to kind of get back into swimming for the first time in say four, five, six years. And friends were asking me to help them train for a triathlon, just asking for swim tips. So I kind of found like, okay, I'm enjoying this as a coaching role now without being paid, mind you. Then I was being paid a little bit as I kind of realized I could charge something to these friends. Then it got to the point where I was living in New York, unhappy with my job and loving this little 2% of my week side gig in the water. So I packed up shop and I moved to Austin. So back to Texas, but not my hometown of Dallas. The first time I went to a different place in Texas that I really love because Austin's got some funk to it. Yep. So went full bore. My first business was called Mineo Athletics, which is my last name. And at that point, it was kind of a hybrid of like yoga, personal training, swim coaching. Knowing that swimming was my like passion, I didn't really know how to make a like offering out of that yet. So I kind of just put all of it together into one umbrella and like, here I am, this is what I do, like pay me and I'll do any of these things. And it kind of worked. I mean, I made enough money to pay my bills for a while. And as like, I kind of got closer and closer to that tippy end of like, of who I am, I realized that swimming really is my, like my gift to share with others. So I think maybe three years into that, I went full bore also into swim coaching and open water swim coaching in Texas. Which it's a big market. <laughs> it, it, it sounds crazy. It sounds like the silliest like market, but it also actually is a pretty hungry market. I think because there's not the offering there, or there wasn't at this time. So here I come with this like really unique idea to help people like groom them towards triathlon. And a lot of these guys, it's overcoming a fear, which we'll talk about as well. So I had a very niche market, but a very, very like, active, engaged audience. So day one, when I launched my first open water program, which was just Maneo Athletics, I think it was open water workout or something silly of the sort, very apt name. People were, were like stoked on it. People were there week one, pay me money. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had to truly fake it till I made it because from, I, from a coaching standpoint or like what you wanted to do with them, man, kind of both really. Like, I think I, I knew what I wanted to do with them as far as create comfort and community and like a supportive environment me being that support but i didn't know how to create the shape out of that and i didn't really know how to make an offering where people would want to pay money for it so really week one in the first months i'm sure were very similar as me in a kayak and people swimming out to the kayak and back to the shore and like me kind of getting a pep talk and cheering them on and doing some photos which they loved and it was just that trial and error of seeing like what was working and what wasn't that ultimately shaped the offering I have now with smog. 
So as a group build, uh, as a group grew, I also like my interest and passion for this grew exponentially. I was like, this is pretty amazing. I'm making money in the open water. No one else does this. Like it's super rewarding to see people overcome their fears. So at the time uh, I was married and I was like, let's move to California. She was up for it. We moved to California literally for the ocean. And so you, th at that time, you, you couldn't find anyone who was doing like open water training, right? No, in the area there was a tri group, and yeah. I think they would do like they would do a, a they would swim, do a swim, but it wasn't focused. It on. wasn't focused, and it wasn't a regular thing. I think it was a seasonal thing. Maybe they'd have a kickoff, and but there was nothing consistent that was really offering people the ability to grow within that. Got it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so you go to California. No clients, nothing, right? I didn't know anybody. Okay. <laughs> I think I had like a college buddy or two who was like somewhere in the Southern California area, not within the triathlon space or swimming space and just kind of went for it. Yeah. Same thing. I faked it, faked it till I made it. Uh, I think I gained some, some haters along the way. I gained a lot of followers along the way, but I was happy. It was like, I, w I was in the right place because every day I'd wake up and I was like just so, so on fire to do this. And I remember my very first swim in Redondo Beach, like going out there and like playing in the waves. I felt like a like a kid, like yeah. the way kids do. And I was like that kid, like, oh, like 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 each wave would come and I would like laugh and like celebrate it. I'm like, this is so amazing. <laughs> it feels more doughboy. boy. Totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean that that's how I was. And you know what? Today I'm still the yeah. same. Like every single wave to me is like opportunity, is, is excitement. So when I see people, which is most people that need help getting literally past the waves. I'm the first one there to offer my help, whether yeah. it's a paid thing or not. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. So how did so then? How did Smog come to be? Because that's how I met you right through this group. And so yeah. did that form initially, or did that take time to develop? The idea was there from the start. And what does Smog stand for? Good I question. know Swim Mechanic, but I don't know. Yeah, the... Swim Mechanic Ocean Group. Okay, got it, got it. I, I at first I was like Swim Mechanic OG, like he's the first <laughs> one. <laughs> well, well, the LA group is the OG group okay. now for sure. Um, we were Saturday mornings always, so it could be Saturday morning ocean group. Okay. But the cleverness, of course, was the smog in LA. And so the acronym is kind of like life open office. Like, that's perfect. Yeah. It's got some funky name recognition that is totally opposite of what we do. So smog came about, the idea was there, the know-how was kind of there. The execution hadn't really like taken shape yet. So I had hustled to find clients and that looks like, you know, working at the Equinox gym, offering swim classes, networking doing a little bit of this and that and just miss meeting people really. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately I was flying back to Dallas like every three or four weeks to pay the bills. Got it. I did that for like 16 months. Cause you had your group still in Dallas. I still had my group. Okay. I still had a really loyal client base. And so I would go fly back there and make some money. And that's, that was the only way I was making money period. At the time my wife was uh, a resident. She wasn't making money. So it was kind of up to me at this point, which I liked the idea of that, but it was scary too. So with some fire under my feet, I was like, I've got to make this work. So I launched Smog without having any name or any sort of big vision for it. That would have been a little over five years ago. And it was myself. It was an Olympic gold medalist that was in the group. And then it was a true beginner, uh, Megan Tobin, who is actually one of my coaches now in San Francisco. That's awesome. So like this really weird, unassuming mix of people that kind of set the tone for what the like the look of the group would be long term meaning like the arms wide open community where everyone's welcome it's not just the studs it's not just a beginner like let's hold your hand kind of group it's everyone and like we're sharing ocean space together without the ego yeah so it it didn't grow maybe the way you would think it would like it didn't grow in a month or even in a year i think after a year we we're averaging like maybe 15 people so after a year it was like a really close-knit family just in la just in LA. Okay. In fact, it was just LA for about three, three and a half years. But I was honest on that. It felt really good. And take in mind, this is a free offering. So I'm oh, showing so you up, weren't even charging then? No, okay. I didn't charge for three and a half years. So I'm, I'm showing up every Saturday morning, walking down the stairs barefoot. I know it's tough life, <laughs> but still I was showing up every week with my, with this, like this big vision, this plan and, and my time. Of course I was, I was, I was uh, offering and nothing in return, nothing like nothing guaranteed in return. But it was the idea of it that really got me feeling good. I, I knew I was doing something right. It didn't, it just didn't quite know what that was yet. So with that, of course, it fed my client base a little bit, not, not in a big way where I was, I was printing money by any means, but it was sustaining itself to some degree. 
I remember the first round of like printing swim caps with the word smog on there like that. It just sealed it for me. Nothing, like, nothing compares to like the first time you brand something. Or create, yeah, yeah. And I remember like making a round of shirts as well. I think through like Vista print mm -hmm. that were like super terrible, you know, someone's like the worst cotton ever. Oh, just like, yeah. like shrinks to yeah. like a, from a large to a small <laughs> within one washing. And, and, but just like, it does kind of create something that's more, uh, permanent, tangible, to, tangible. Yeah. And so after that first round of caps, it felt really good. And, and that's, I think, when I really saw something there bigger than just like a group. Uh, but still, it, it was a very organic, slow burn. It wasn't like this really fast pop where people are showing up, like throwing money at me. Yeah. So I think people see that today. They're like, man, you're so lucky to be on the beach and people pay you to get in the water. But that's like everything, right? Like totally. no one sees, you know, totally. It's the, it's the classic like, oh, overnight success. But For sure. Yeah. It, no one sees the, the past and what it took to get there. Right. And yeah. I don't have any good advice for that, except for whatever you're passionate about, do that because you're yeah. going to be good at that. Well, and I always tell people too, if, if you're, if you're doing something you're happy with and you're not making any money, at least you're happy. Sure. Right. Like, and eventually if you keep doing that, you're going to figure out a way to make some money out of it, but, totally. or you could just be miserable, you know, and have money. So you kind of pick which route you want to go. So. And that's very true. And, and I think seeing the latter of the people that are miserable, it, it's it's tough to watch because they have a very easy option, I think, to go a different path, but it's vulnerable to do mm -hmm. so. And I, I've I've always stepped into that vulnerable space most of my life when I have the opportunity to. And I think more because I'm like a nonconformist. I'm not the kind of guy that would be a good employee. Yeah. Like I just I march by the beat of my own drum. I'm very individual in a lot of ways. So I see people like that and I get to work with those people every week, which I love because I think for like one small window per week, that's their, that's yeah. it. Yep. And they're there and they're childlike, they're having <clears throat> fun, they're expressing themselves, they're overcoming fear. And it's like, I see these people in a very humanizing, like leveling way where at work they're the CEO or they're mm -hmm. the ones that are intimidating you yep. as the employee. Yeah, exactly. So how did, well, I want to get back to the fear in, in yeah. a bit, but how did, so how did small grow from LA? to now, how many cities are you in? We've got eight going on 11, which sounds okay. crazy to launch so what's three. What, can you name them all off? Or yeah, is yeah. it like children so that you forget their name? No, 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 <laughs> yeah, no, we only have one child, so I can, okay. I can name our baby Sophia. But uh, so in order, uh, we did LA, and then after year three, we launched San Francisco. And that was a happy accident because the, the woman, Megan, I mentioned to you, she moved to San Francisco, which was really emotional. She was a really big piece of the group and the energy and the enthusiasm in the group. She moved and she's like, I want to start as small as San Francisco. And at that point, I hadn't even thought about trying to like create any like standardization to this where we can franchise or branch out. So I was like, okay, go for it. And I've, I had coached her at that point for three years. I was confident that she knew my methodology, the general feel of smog. She launched that. The third group was smog in San Diego because I moved down to San Diego to be with my wife. After that, it kind of picked up steam and then there like the doors are sort of opening quickly. In the past year, it's been like boom, 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 like hard to keep up. The fourth one was smog in Maine, in Portland, Maine, believe it or not. So random. Which is random and so rad. It's like it's a burly <laughs> small group of like really cold water swimmers. Um, they've got an island off of their like their swim spot there. They swim out to the island and have coffee. It's, it's, awesome. it's super cool. Uh, fifth was smog in Hawaii in Oahu. Sixth was smog in Sierra Nevadas. They do Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. and Jenkinson Lake. They alternate. Seventh was I'm blanking now. Seventh was smog in oh, what was next? I jinxed you. Yeah, <laughs> Austin was next. Mexico City's coming up. Kona's coming up. Mexico City. Yeah. Who's doing Mexico City? This triathlete friend of mine That's who's awesome. a, a total stud. It's going to be awesome. Okay. And Kona's going to be awesome. Yep. Uh, we're launching Miami as well. And I'm missing one of there, which I feel really bad, whoever I'm missing there. So there'll Orange be a, County. Orange County. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm the leader of that. So, <laughs> yeah. So Orange County was, was one, one of the more recent ones. Okay. Well. Yeah. So what is, what's your process for setting these up? I know you said the first one was like accident. Now you have it formalized or is yeah, it? Yeah. So I've created an online course that I have not released yet called Open Water Mastery. And within that, I've created a template for how to train my coaches. Like how to mentor the coaches in a way where it's a bit standardized, but a bit where I allow total freedom for you to create the group the way you want to. So if you can imagine like the vetting process for me is the hardest part. It's like, I, I need to know that you want to create a community. You're not there for the money. You're not there for anything beyond like wanting to connect people and like truly help people. Because I think out of like the pillars that are smog, 
like the third and least important pillar is the swimming component, <laughs> which sounds yeah. crazy, but we just happen to swim. Yeah. But the group is all about community, service, and then swimming. So it takes us a very special person, not a special swimmer necessarily, or a coach for that matter, a person that has that ability to communicate and to like be a strong leader in a way where people feel welcomed and really like inclusive. That is like the bread and butter of smog. For sure. Yeah. And then you, so you select those people, they create and then build up the community on their own? With my help. Okay. Yeah. Right. So like with, with our like collective social networks. Yep. We're putting the word out there, and I think it's been long running enough that we have a bit of clout to say, like, hey, like we are a long-standing open water group that goes year-round. We're now a 501c3. We're donation-based. People get stoked on that. People yeah. want to see that there's something that is giving back while they're also bettering themselves. Yeah. So how did the 501c3 come into play? Because I'm curious about that. That's something we talked about before. But Yeah. Also, maybe a happy accident. I think I, I've been spinning my wheels for the past three years to find like the true definition of what I want smog to be. It grew bigger than I wanted it to be, or maybe than I anticipated it to be within that like third year. We were getting like 150 to 200 people on the beach on Saturday mornings, which is awesome. It's really cool. But I have a hard time sleeping at night when I'm like, wait, did, did I get everyone back to shore? Did all 200 make it back? It's just the numbers grew unruly. Even with the three paddlers we would have, we would have a lifeguard there. It's just a lot. And I, I saw that somewhat deconstructing the community that I wanted as far as like how close knit it felt. There was just a ton of people. And I don't, I don't ever want to be just like a bunch of faces where we're like we're just happen to be in the same place at the same mm -hmm. time wanting to work out. So I then went to the paid model very inexpensively. I think it was like 200 bucks for the year, a paid model. And it worked pretty well because I think then people felt invested in it and yep. the numbers were similar, maybe a little bit smaller in a, in a good way. And people felt like they were part of something, but I didn't really feel good at the end of the day. Like I wasn't trying to make money off of this necessarily. I was trying to pay the permit fees mm -hmm. and the ability to keep growing the group, but I never saw this as like a business opportunity. So the past two years I've like lost sleep over this as well, where I'm like, what, what is this? Like, I don't want this to be a long-term thing where I'm just it's a paid membership. It's not, it's not enough. It's not what we're trying to do. So the idea of the nonprofit came from when we started beach cleanups, which we did about two years ago, every single weekend before the swim, we do beach cleanup, very small gesture that like, is like showing some respect to our beach and appreciation of what we have. And then from there, my vision started to really grow. And it's like, I can't sleep now because I'm excited about all the ideas that are coming up. So apply for the nonprofit got approved. That was just a couple months ago. And just in announcing that, it's interesting how everything's changed. Like now partners, like there's more people who are willing to want to work with us. But they see our intention. It's not like I'm not trying to be this for-profit yeah, yeah. that's building this like mecca. But I think along the way, I think we can build a really powerful, really big group. And we're already in the 2000s right now as far as numbers go. So I want to talk about like what the nonprofit is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and it comes back to my experience when I was 18. I had a near drowning experience in a lake in Texas, which seemed ironic as a swimmer growing up. Um, I won't, I'll, I'll do the abridged version of this, but I was very humbled by not knowing how to swim in the open water as my first try at it at 18. And just, I mean, it was in my mind, a near death experience. It probably was not. So I was probably in like six to eight foot deep water. But I remember getting back to shore and kind of hanging my head like, like what, what was that? Like the one thing that I really think is my biggest identifier to who I am is also my first fear that I had found, which was really weird and just confusing at 18. It's like, wait, so what? I kept it to myself and I would drive 30 minutes to this lake every day after school for weeks. And I kind of created this methodology that I loosely teach now with people on how to overcome this fear. And day one was me just standing in like the shallows. It's like standing there and breathing. Like day two is maybe submerging my head. Day three was swimming along the shore and just kind of advanced from there. So that, that really sparked my like understanding of how people feel with their fear of the open water. And I, I would say that's probably 90% of the, of the population, literally. And I got really good at that because I've done it before. So people would come to me like wanting stroke technique. I'm doing, I'm racing for uh, Ironman. I'm trying to work on my time and they get there on day one and they've got fear. It's freaked out. Freaked out. Yeah. And we spend day one, maybe even day two and three all on the breath, all on visualizations, all on spending time just in the surf and finding comfort and control of the breath. 
and they're always humbled by this as well. And then I can kind of relive and tell my story. Like I was there too. And this is the foundation for life is, is your breath and, and owning that and knowing how to regulate that. And that can be like both like a metaphor and like a reality for a lot of people as far as how well you're performing. So I've noticed a lot of people step ahead three, four, five, six steps when they go back to that basic stuff of the breath and of controlling their mind, it unlocks all the doors. Mm -hmm. And so smog for me has become that where it's like overcoming a fear and, and creating freedom for you. That's what the group is. Got it. So afterwards on the beach, we're having coffee. I mean, you've, you've been yeah, there. Yeah. The coffee on the kayak is probably one of my favorite <laughs> open water experiences. My dad literally, so I posted for those of you who don't know, uh, so what you call it barista or the paddling barista paddling barista. So, uh, we go out. So Saturday morning, Redondo, um, set up the buoys. We did this swim and you literally said like, just swim until you see coffee. <laughs> and so we were doing laps around and uh, all of a sudden there's a kayaker with a five gallon jug of coffee on the back. And we're all, we're probably like what? 150 <laughs> yards out. Sure. So yeah. in, in the ocean, just drinking coffee. And it's just a fun, cool, like something you would no not normally do. Totally. And so my dad's like, you know, he lives in the mountains and everything. So like, what is this? is this LA shit you guys are doing? Like, <laughs> of course you need coffee in the ocean. And I'm like, dude, it's fun. Like, it <laughs> oh, well, and we're making fun of ourselves too. We're exactly. like, we got an orange milk or frappuccino, exactly. you know, like a soy latte. Yeah. It, it, I think it adds to the experience of like not taking it too seriously. You can train for triathlon. You can get really fit, mm -hmm. but most of you guys are not getting paid for that. So you may as well like have some have fun, fun doing, doing that. It. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I think that's the one of the biggest things I've found is I got into triathlon because I loved. I kind of felt like, well, this is like the competition I missed from high school. Like I hadn't competed totally. in anything since then, and then it was like, wow, this is cool. Like community and building. And then it was like the next thing of like, all right, I need better equipment. And I feel yeah. like everyone goes through this progression. And then you get to a point of like, okay, I'm spending all this money. I'm spending all this time <laughs> away from friends and family. Like, what am I actually doing? And yeah. you kind of lose sight of that, like initial, like that feeling of why you were doing it. And I went through that and I, I like literally stopped. I was like, this is like, I'm not having fun. I don't enjoy training. I don't enjoy the races. Yeah. And then it took me a while to get back into it. And I think honestly kind of open water swimming got me back into it of like this is what i meant like this is what i love doing and just getting back in the pool and then kind of figuring out how to really run because sure. I, I never knew how to run i just thought it was a, a normal human function like if you're getting <laughs> chased by something you run you do it and uh, um so i think like learning all those things and then the other thing was like dropping all the fancy shit we like i didn't like i had a power meter on my bike and i'm like I'd never used like, right. What does it matter? Like, yeah. I, I want to go out and have fun. I don't want to worry about five different numbers and yeah. analytics. So I just, I kind of got focused in on the heart rate and now I just enjoy doing what I'm doing, put a plan together and, right. um, and it's become more fun again. So I think that's a, yeah, it's, I think it is important to like figure out your why of why you're doing this sport. Well, and it's so true. And you see the guys in smog and I can't take credit for this too much, but it's, there are some elite athletes for mm -hmm. sure. There's Olympians in the group. There's the true beginner. All of them are training for their own goals, but they're all having a lot of fun doing yeah. it. And I think it's easy to make the other go the other direction where the trial and error, I think, for most people exists where they do go through the getting serious and like they're getting faster, getting more competitive in their age group, buying like fancier gear, blowing money, losing opportunity to spend time with their family and friends, mm -hmm. and they find that happy balance. And I, yeah. I hope that smog is an offering that is a happy balance. It's only a couple hours a week. And families are welcome. Like I'm starting to work on the idea of like a childcare on the beach during the session, cool. yeah. which I think a lot of people would, would, would dig because yeah. they don't go if they've got some kid stuff going yeah, yeah. on. So why can't the kids be on the beach with us? For sure. Which brings me back to my point of the 501c3. Yeah, the five, so, yeah so bring it back. So, so my, my bigger vision now, I think that the better way we can give back beyond beach cleanup and like the health of the oceans, which I'm really passionate about, but it's being done in a lot of ways right now. Uh, is helping people overcome fear of the ocean in a very like hands-on sort of way with our members. So my, my vision is to do it with kids. So I have a free offering where it's open water safety education for kids and I have a program, a weekly program where all the smog members, key members are chosen and trained to then help them through the surf and work on that programming. So it really starts at a young age. If I would have been in the ocean at a young age, I wouldn't have had that experience at 18. The parents tend to push it onto their kids. If they have fear, the kids are going to have fear. So I think just as like a life skill, we need open water safety and open water um, understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea moving forward is, is creating programming for kids 
in the open water. Got it. So and when you look at, um, so kids is one thing, right? Because kids are, like you said, they're programmed by their parents or whatever their sure. life experience. Some have zero fear, right? Yeah. Um, but when you when you are working with adults, what is, because I know there's a lot of people, I get DMs all the time of like, I could never do that. Like I can never go out <laughs> in the ocean or I can never, yeah. like, so what, what do you feel like is the biggest fear? I joke about sharks all the time, but what do you feel is the biggest fear of what's keeping people out of being in the water? Lack of control. Okay. Which is probably not what most people would think, but. But that can be related to a number look, of different aspects. Totally. And then that can look at any sort of way. And I think people create their own narratives of what that looks like. Lack of control, meaning not being able to dictate exactly how things play out. And that's the ocean. The ocean's moving. The ocean's dynamic. It's changing. Where on land, you have a literal base. Mm-hmm. So I think people create a lot of fear in their head around not knowing what the conditions are going to be like as far as waves. Are there sharks out there? Are there other things out there I'm going to see in the water? Am I going to get hit by a stingray? So it's easy for this narrative to like quickly go down the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And then before you get in the water, you've had plenty of time to rehearse that over and over and over. And by the time you get there, your dress rehearsal is a negative one that you're expecting the worst. And you're going to create the worst when you get out there. Can you attract sharks? <laughs> if you're thinking about sharks, will a shark come find you? That's what I, mean, I want to know. It is one of those things I love talking about sharks. And like yeah. it, it, we even have shark attack survivors in our group. Do we really? And we actually have two. We have in one LA? in LA and then one in Orange County. Really? Yes, the guy in LA, Steve Robles, he was the one that was attacked five years ago at Manhattan Beach Pier. When the guy was fishing? Yep. Okay. So he's in, he's in smog. Got it. So, comes you, out. so so for those who don't know, there was so people swim around the pier. There's yep. fishermen off the pier. From what I know, the fisherman had a fish on. Or did he have the shark on? He had the shark on, supposedly. Okay. And for an amount of time, half an hour, I don't know what it was, he cut the line as Steve and a few of the swimmers were rounding the pier. And a very probably in pain, like upset shark is just in pain, latching yeah. onto whatever. And he took a bite. They don't have hands, obviously. Yep. He took a bite at Steve. Um, and that, that was it. And okay. if you hear about him, if you hear him talk about it now, which actually I had him on my podcast, he he loves sharks. He loves the ocean. He knows it wasn't like the shark's fault. Yeah, like, the shark wasn't in, wasn't out for him. How big was that shark? Uh, Twenty five feet, I think. Really? No, okay, no, 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 like, no, I don't know. It, it was it was a juvenile, probably okay. six to ten feet, okay. something like that. So our size. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a big animal. I mean, it, it's a big animal. Yeah. But the truth is, we're, we're not on their menu. When yeah. you understand their feeding patterns and what they're looking for, we're we're way more of a threat to them. Yeah. And I think as humans, we're really a threat to everything else. Unfortunately. Yeah. So sharks are something I feel pretty often, often like the the waves are are one thing that really holds people up. And that's, I think, a bit of the control thing as well, because the waves are so variable, Mm -hmm. even on on a certain day when it's, say, small surf, there can still be a big wave, not not a rogue wave, but a a big wave that comes through like, well, that was a crazy set. In fact, we had that last week with the coffee kayak. I had that five gallons called a Combro with... Three other guys were trying to get this like gnarly 50 pound thing of coffee through the surf. And I posted that video, I don't know if you saw it, where like yeah, we're, flipping we're over getting and, flipped on yeah. like, like holding this with all dear life to like not let it fall back. And this is not my coffee thing. I don't want to ruin this in the ocean. They're like, oh, here's this ruined yeah. coffee thing back. Um, so that was one of those unexpected things. And we made it a lot of fun. And it was, it was a lot of fun and now super memorable. Mm-hmm. So I think for people, it's a lot of learning to control their brains and rewire these like these narratives they create and, and these this patterning of thinking that tends to go to the negative side of, of, of self-doubt. Ocean swimming is not hard, but you can make it really hard. Mm-hmm. And most people tend to make it really hard by just avoidance. Yeah. I mean, I even find, so my brother surfs a lot and I never really enjoyed it. I mean, not that I didn't enjoy it, but I, I swam my whole life. I would be nervous on a board but I could go out in the toughest surf and just myself in a wetsuit and be completely comfortable and confident. Yeah. And I always felt like maybe that's the lack of control because I had this board I had to hold on to and I wasn't in control because it was pulling me or I didn't know how to control it, whatever sure. it was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could, like I almost love like the gnarly, crazy surf and just like calming my body down yeah. and just letting it take wherever it goes. And yep. um, so yeah, it's interesting to, to hear that because I always would think to me, it's always creatures. That's what people are most scared about. But you're right. Like the waves can be. I think it's more the waves. Yeah. yeah. And this sounds grandiose that like what, what smog is, but unintentionally, I think what I've created is like a platform for people to unlock a lot of like overcoming a fear opportunity. 
So they leave this, the ocean swim, overcoming that fear that day. They, they say hit a big, big milestone. They leave there. That's going to be the hardest part of their day, guaranteed. So it does instill this confidence and this momentum starts to build. Like, okay, well, I did that. I can probably do this, whatever that might be. So it just creates a lot of energy and a lot of positivity and a lot of strength that I think otherwise it's hard to tap into. Yeah. The ocean is the perfect vehicle for that because it's always on. Year round, it's on. It never stops. So what I've found is being in the, in the ocean as often as possible, that's going to feed into your life more than anything else I've found. 100%. So I started like doing triathlons. I never really swam in open water except for the races. Oh, wow. Like I would swim in the pool and then like <laughs> then I'd go in the ocean or a lake, whatever yeah. it was. Um, and I always loved it, but I never, I, I probably just didn't, I didn't research enough, didn't find groups to go with, right? Um, and then so training for Alcatraz this year, escape from Alcatraz, um, I had a coach for the first time, which was awesome. And he was like, you should be in the water, in open water at least once a week. And I started, and that's when I was like, I got to figure this thing out. Yeah. So I found a group in Manhattan that meets up. Um, and then I found you guys. And, uh, and now it's become like a complete addiction. Like, and oh, it's, yeah. there's nothing like, I was in the ocean this morning, right? Like, there's nothing like coming out of the water in the morning and having your whole day ahead and whatever it is, like, the ions, you know, just the feeling you have of like that waking up when you hit the water. Right. Um, it's like the days I don't go in the ocean, I'm like, it's, I need an extra cup of coffee. Like oh, it's just not the same, you 100%. know? Um, so I think that's a unique, even so think about me being in the sport for seven years or whatever it was and never really taking advantage of like, I'm able to swim. I'm capable. I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, we live here. Yeah. Why not go into the ocean? You yeah. know? So um, I think that's cool how it's how it's kind of developed. And well, but even hearing you say that, I, I I tend to think like, well, we have such a luxury living near the ocean. But you know what? Most people have a luxury of living near a body of water. Something. It's yeah. something. I mean, it's like seventy percent of the Earth is blue. Yep. So again, that's why I really think the open water is for everyone. Like everyone can take from it, whether they realize it or not. And maybe it's even as a cold plunge. Maybe it's in the winter, or if you're in a cold area in the summer, just getting in the cold water and doing yep. an ice bath. Yep. There is something to it. We're all very positively drawn to the water and like it positively affected by it as well. For us, it takes shape as a swim. For others, it might not. So there's something there that I'm trying to grasp. Sure. I'm like, we, we really all need the open water. It is the life. Ocean feeds the energy of the earth. It's yeah. like there's there's a lot there. Some, some connection. For sure. We, we go super deep. <laughs> um, so, so, so transitioning into, you know, so you've developed the smog thing. Um, your swim career, um, I'm curious about, I think it was, it was like an Instagram post with this guy who had like climbed Everest and then swam the English channel. Ooh. And I started thinking of like, for me, I'm like, okay, I've been doing this sport for a while and it's like, now I'm like back to loving it again and, and picking the races I want to race and not putting pressure on myself, um, to like, I've got to, you know, hit this certain point or right. you know, times, whatever it is. Um, but now I've gotten to the point of like, like, that's cool. Like, I mean, the Everest, I, it is what it is. Like I, I know some people that have done it and I'm like, I don't want to, yeah. you know, go down that path, but swim in the English channel. Like that's something that's cool. And so I started like thinking like, what, what, what could I do? That's a challenge, but also like something I can like stick a flag in. Like, I'm proud. I did that. Not that the races I'm not proud of, sure. but something like super unique. Yep. Right. Um, and so I think I, I emailed or text you or something was like, Hey, have you ever swum the English channel? And you're like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is super ironic that you yeah. asked me that. So I have not swum the English channel. Um, I would just call it incredibly unfinished business right now. And, and I think about it nearly every day still. So I think this was six years ago, seven years ago, I started training for it and was in, it's a tough place in my life. I was still in Texas. I was probably unhappy in certain ways. And I put all the energy into training. So I was like taking ice baths every night, eating yeah. ice cream in the ice bath. And for those listening and watching, the English Channel is the channel between England and France. Yeah, it's like how, 21 how plus 21. miles. Okay. The right. water is like 60 degrees tops. It's cold. Sounds fun. Yeah, it's the most highly trafficked sea lane in the world. So really? you've got some gnarly conditions. Um, the tides can be really unrelenting. It's just, it's just known to be one of the hardest swims in the world. I think for a long time it was going to be the hardest swim in the world. So for me, I'm like, I want to do that. And I think because I had had a relatively pretty easy life. You I wanted the adversity. I wanted the adversity. I wanted to like really feel something hard and like know that I could like rise to the occasion. So somewhat like without even having much education on this, I, I started doing research, but I was like, I'm going to sign up for it right now. I 
realize there's a lot more than just signing up for like a race. You have to find a boat pilot in England. You have to wire the guy money, like you know, just through reserve spot, just, just through yeah. email. Like like you're just trusting. Like here goes two thousand dollars to this guy. So I got my boat. I got the date. I was official with like the CSA, the, the Swimming Association for for um, England. And everything's in place. My date is about a year out at this point. I'm training pretty well the next 12 months. Volume's building. I'm tired as hell. I'm What'd tired. You get up to? Caps like 50K in a week. Okay. I think most of the guys that would do it would get close to like 70K, probably peak week, something like that. But 50K in a week. How many miles is that? Uh, that's to get the calculator that's out. It's like, I don't know, it's like 30 miles, okay. 30 plus right. miles. It's a lot. It's a mm -hmm. lot of miles. So anyhow, so training's going pretty well. Personal life is probably not going that well, but I'm still very focused on this. My hardest thing, popular to contrary, like contrary to popular belief is like, I don't put on weight very well. And like, I'm joking because you look at me, I'm like, I'm pretty skinny. So like muscle, I can put on decently well. Fat just does not stick on my body, which is great, but not great for a cold water swim. So I'm having trouble with that. Uh, get closer to the race. Where People I'm, feel real sorry for you, by the way. For sure. That's why I'm always reluctant to say that, but I'm um, sorry. It's a yeah. great problem to have for sure. Um, so like four months out, start going through a divorce and that kind of derails more mentally than anything else. I'm not in a good headspace. I'm starting to convince myself that I can't do this swim anymore. Ultimately, I drop out. And I think from that, I got some criticism from people because I had like made big plans. I had announced it. I was on the cover of a magazine in Dallas kind of against like my will like mm -hmm. i didn't necessarily want all that attention but once i made the announcement i'm doing this it was a unique thing for someone from dallas to do so i got tons of pr from this and it made me feel uncomfortable because i think at that point that put a lot of pressure on me beyond it being a very personal goal mm -hmm. it became a public goal is this pre-social media this was not pre-social media this would have been 2013. okay all right. uh pre-instagram for yeah, me yeah. I, I had facebook then but I, I don't think i had like a big following or anything yeah. um so People knew about it for sure. Okay. And locally in my community, remember I was the swim coach. Yep. I was the like, creator of these open water groups. Everyone knew about it. So that's all we were talking about was like, well, how's your training going? How's your training going? And it, 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 honestly, it was going terribly like <laughs> because I was thinking about it all the time and it just, things weren't working that well. And so then the divorce happens and all of this sort of falls apart and, and just decomposes. And I, I drop out of it. And I think I was in a bit of a funk after that because one, I hadn't proved anything to myself as far as like, could I do this? Two people were asking about it and it just, it was a tough time, but I flipped it around and realized, wait, I committed something for a very long-term goal and I trained all the way through that. So I was like, wait a minute, like I have accomplished a lot so far, but I haven't done it and I still haven't done it. And I've thought about it a lot. So what became like, what was originally just like kind of a, a crazy goal now is something that I feel like there's like a dot, dot, dot there. And I, I do want to do it. And when I met my, my wife now, Courtney, she sort of re-inspired me to do it and got me fired up about it. And then I sort of, I held back again. So like this time through, I need to make sure I'm hundred percent ready to do it. Uh, I don't announce it. So when I train for it, no one's going to know. Really? Just so you know, I'm not going to tell anybody. Are you, and you don't plan on putting a group together or anything? You're going to do it solo? I'm going to do it solo. Okay. Yeah. People do it solo because it'd be tough to organize several people with the same ability okay. to do yep, this kind of swim. Because it's so long. It's yeah. so long. And after 12 hours, you might be seasick. Yep. I might be falling apart, whatever it is. So typically it's a solo swim. There's relays, but typically a solo swim. So I think I'm going to do it someday. I don't know when that's going to be. And I'm in no rush anymore. I've got, I've like kind of like released that like pressure on myself to need to do this because I have nothing to prove. I'm not saying I'm the best swimmer in the world. I'm a very passionate swimmer yeah, yeah. and the open water for me is like, that's home. So maybe down the road, maybe it's an equally crazy hard swim, but maybe in warmer water. Like that for me sounds more tangible and like more realistic. Is there anything else you're looking at or wanted to do? Kind of. I, I kind of want to create my own swim. I, okay. I, I want to do something that it's a one of a kind thing. And so I, I'm looking at some stuff in warmer water. I'll at least say that. Hawaii Islands? Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps in Hawaii. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there, there are a lot of options out there. And there yeah. are a lot of swims that are already out there that are like long running and really successful. Um, Maui Channel, Waikiki, Rough Waters, a lot of really cool swims. Okay. So that that's my story with English Channel. And it, it does kind of like, I still feel it when I talk about it. And I, I kind of resort to this feeling of like, well, what do people think of me? And that's been one of the long standing things I've dealt with as far as that self-critic is what do people think about me? And now I've kind of gotten through that where I'm less worried about that and more about how can I make other people feel about themselves? 
And that makes me feel really good. Yeah. Not so much like, do I have to prove to somebody else? Like the people pleasing inside of me is, is gone away where that was a big piece of who I was for most of my life. Yeah. But I think, but I think doing something like that, you also forget how much you inspire other people too. Sure. So like in the process, you lose that, you know, perspective of even though it's all internal, it's taking you to do all this stuff. Yeah. You forget the outside factors of how that impacts other people, which is it's cool. Even like doing like, so doing Alcatraz was the first time, not the first time, but I really put out like my whole training and yeah. started put in like, it was crazy to see the amount of people that were like, I went, I, I woke up and ran this morning cause I saw you running, you know, like, I'm like, this is pretty cool. That's like, so cool. Like that makes it, I you, like you, you get so internal about the training and like in your head about everything that you forget that you're affecting people around you in a positive way. Sure. Um, so I think that's uh so don't, don't hide it. Put no, it no, you're right. I shouldn't yeah. hide it, but I think I've gotten more addicted to helping the others. Yeah. And, and maybe that that's a bit of like an excuse for me to not have to put the goal on myself anymore, but there is something super rewarding about training you to swim something that you haven't done before or yeah. to do a, an ultra marathon, whatever. And it is pretty cool to see people get fired up. Like, man, like thanks to smog, I've been coming every week now for a year. I did my first one mile swim or I did my first, whatever it is. That's cool. And that, yeah. that feeds me pretty, pretty well. Yeah. yeah. So if you had, so looking at all the small groups and all the people you've come in contact with, you said that there is an aspect of it that like really gets people out of the, they could be a big fish out in the real world, but then when they come to yeah. smog, everyone's on the same level. Right. Yeah. So like, what is it? What would you recommend for people who have never swam before or that are interested in it? Like what, what's, why should they come out? What should, why should they even, you know, bother getting connected with the ocean? I think the idea for them is that personal freedom I kind of mentioned before okay. is to learn how to step into whatever that wall, whatever that fear is the ocean being a really easy one, because like most people already have that fear in grains. So there's not any convincing of like, Hey, when you do this, you're yeah. going to come out on the other side feeling way better. So I think more than anything else is the community. Okay. So even aside from like the breaking through those walls, the community is, I mean, it's a very tangible, like palpable thing that it's hard to explain, but it, it, uh, it feels like you're part of a family. Yeah. Like everyone there, you feel welcomed and you feel seen. And when it comes down to it, everyone wants to be seen. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to feel like they're understood, they're listened to, and they're part of something. And smog's that. Like when you go to smog, say if that group were meeting at the park or in a building somewhere, you would have no idea what their common bond is. You'd be like, what possibly is the common thread amongst these people? And I love that. Yeah. Like, I, I totally love that. So when you come to the beach, it's like, okay, like you're one of these people. You, no one stands out. Even the Olympians, they don't stand out. Not, yeah. Most people don't even know who they are in the group. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of like it that way because they're no better or different than you or me. Like we, they happen to have some really cool accomplishments, but so do we. So I think the best reason to come to Smog is to feel like you're a part of a community and, and to really to really be welcomed into something. Yeah. Because beyond this, I, I do see Smog growing into other places. We, we offer bike rides and runs and there's social stuff, but I see it, it's a, it's a network. And, and these people now, I mean, I've got my chiropractor, I've got a lawyer, I've got, it's like, I have everything built in now from Smog. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. Yeah. So, you know, for, from the Smog aspect of building this thing up, um, what is it? Well, and you have the small cast as well, right? Yep. So, um, out of the small podcast, you've interacted with a lot of people, um, throughout the group, you've interacted with a lot of people. What are kind of your biggest takeaways from either some of the people you've had on the guests you've had on, or just learn from people in that group interacting with them once a week? That's a good question. I think what's been the coolest thing to see, and maybe the most humanizing, humbling piece is that we're all very similar. So I'll interview the Olympic swimmer on there and I, I have on, on this particular podcast and their stories are not different than mine. Like they've gone through the same hardship. They've, they've had really rough stuff happen to them. Maybe they weren't even a good swimmer until they were in their teen years. So I think it's neat to see the human process not being that like pretty linear as far as we're all doing it and experiencing the same way. There's no fast tracking that. Some people express it in different ways and achieve things that might look bigger or better. They're really not. So I found that, that we should all find ways to reward ourselves for who we are and what we do. Because I think we all sell ourselves short pretty often. I, I do it all the time. Like I'm, I'm humble to a, to a fault. 
where like I don't really accept my successes. And I, and I see small gains is success. And I've, I've never really said that before, but I've brought people together that make me feel good and it goes reciprocally both ways. So long answer short here, we're all the same. And I think it's important to highlight your strengths and to celebrate those things because that's what makes you unique. That's what makes you you. And that's that's what's gonna really create your your magic, your, your special something. Yeah. So for those people looking for create, so I mean, there's a lot of people that listen that are either entrepreneurs or they're working a job and wanna, they have an idea of something they wanna do. So you took this thing that you wanted to do that you loved and eventually created obviously a business and community out yeah. of it. So what advice would you give for people that are either stuck and have something they want to do, just don't know how to make the leap or just don't even know where to get started? Sure. For me, I think the answer simply is making the, the, the short list of your passions, making the short list of your strengths and then finding the cross sections there. So like with those, with those two lists, how can you combine two of those somethings to create a unique offering? So for me, Smog here, I wasn't even the first open water group, and I like I don't need to claim that either. I, I wasn't, but what we did differently was we had the arms wide open community that allowed people to come that maybe would have fear or that didn't want the ego part of it. So for anyone that has an idea, think about okay, so what do I have to offer? Like you're an empathic person that has a huge heart and like infinite patience. That's a huge asset. If that's who you are, think about how can you offer that with your niche field to create something that's going to attract people. So my, my approach always is do you the way you want to do it and it's going to work. So if it makes you happy and, and you're passionate about it, you're going to do it really well. Okay. I like it. Yeah. There's one more thing I want to ask you. <laughs> sure. And it's when I pull up the website, there's this picture of you. Oh boy. Did you have long hair? Oh boy. Before, because I was looking at this photo <laughs> And I've been meaning to ask you, so hold on, here it is. That's so awesome. So here's your, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. <laughs> can, you, can you get closer now? No. So you can see my little rat tail, tail hanging out. I was like, what is this thing <laughs> hanging off the side of your head? Okay, well, that, so Photoshop would have done really well in this case. Um, it was not a rat tail. Okay. I kind of wish it were a rat tail. Yep. Uh, I had, okay, so when I moved to California, <laughs> man, I, I felt at home for the first time in, in my life, like I mentioned before. So I embraced it in all the ways. I got 500 tattoos. I was in the sun all day. I'm getting like gnarly tan. And the one like rite of passage I saw was like growing my hair long. I'd never done it before. <laughs> I'm like freshly single. So I, I grow my hair long and like a year passes, two years pass, three years pass. And it was like down to my boobs. Like I had yeah. like super, super long like bleach, sun bleached blonde hair. Yeah. People were calling me like the aquatic Jesus and like it, it, it became my persona for a while Okay, and I kind of miss it a little bit. <laughs> my wife now is like, no, let's yeah. say you did that. It was great. Now we're moving, we're moving on. Okay. I had long hair and I, I totally embraced it. So if Got you look it. back at some old pictures of smog mm -hmm. and like maybe even on the website, yeah. uh, You're like who is that guy? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looked back and I'm like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Like I, it was, it was a different thing. Something with like, when you have a really distinct, like physical mm -hmm. feature, it becomes a part of who you are. And so like, it also became part of like my mannerisms. I would be like playing with my hair a lot. And I would like be twisting my bun and just like, you know, putting it behind my ears. And it did was, you, did you miss the man bun uh, phase? <laughs> did you, did you get out before then? I, I did the man bun oh, okay. phase. Right. I did the high bun, the low bun. Like I, I did all the combinations. That's awesome. And uh, it, it comes with equal supporters and non-supporters. Like mm -hmm. some women love it, some women hate it. It was just fun. Like I, I, I really loved it. Okay. I really did. And there, but there's a bit of infatuation with that because it's new. So I would wear like the little hair tie around your, your wrist. And like, I'm always like putting it up yeah. and taking it down. Yeah. It's crazy. Like it's kind of like beer. Like I feel like that with the beard. Totally. Too. Like, yeah, totally. Okay. And, and you become a man with a beard. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. like you're a man, but then man with a beard is a different class. And somehow it's like a qualification to be like a true man. Okay. Like, wow, he must be, he must be like an outdoorsman. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just need my flannel. <laughs> totally. Um, so I, yeah. I, I, I had long hair up until I think two and a half years ago. All right. And, uh, which makes me realize I should probably update my website a little bit. No, it's good. I, I literally was just like, I saw that and I'm like, is that a piece of seaweed like hanging off the side? No, I'm like, a, no, that's hair. It's a gnarly that lock hair coming right off. there. That's a, that's a tail. That's funny. Yeah. So, so before we go, anything yeah. else you want to, you want to cover or go no, over? No, you know, I, I love 
love talking about this. And I think, as I mentioned before, even as I, I hear myself talking about this, I realize how special it is. And so maybe as a, a little piece of wisdom that I can bestow, it's if you have any inclination or any sort of gut feeling on something, just act on it. Because the whole time I've known this is right, I haven't known how it's going to make money. I haven't known how it's going to shape into anything. But each year presents itself in a bigger way and a lot more rewarding like gifts in, in that. So if you feel like you know something is good and you enjoy it, just do it. It's, it's going to work. But when you go the other way and you're fighting against that resistance of doing something for safety or for other purposes, uh, it's not going to feel too good. So keep it simple and, and just do the things that you're good at and things that you love. I like it. It's a good note to end on. Yeah. How do, uh, how do people find you? Instagram is The Swim Mechanic. Uh, the Smog is Smog Swims, which actually we just launched. The website is swimmechanic.com. And for Smog, it's smog.community. Perfect. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for doing this, man. Likewise, I appreciate Dan. It was fun, yeah. man. All right, brother. Cool. All right.